us. So um, let's see, just about right on time here. I think we'll get started. Uh, a lot of you know me from the B department. We've had uh, interactions, conversations, all sorts of fun stuff going on. So uh, my name's Camille. I've been working here as the beekeeper for about the last three years now. And I uh, want to take you through preparations for beekeeping in the winter months and what you can or shouldn't do during those times. So we'll be going through winter bee behavior, what happens when the cluster forms, how does the cluster actually behave during the winter months when you can't really see what's going on, you can't really get into the hive, what's going on there. Uh, reasons for colony death. There are a lot of reasons out there and it can sometimes be a little bit hard to tell. So I'll try and walk you through signs to look for. If you have a dead out hive, maybe you can do a little bit of di diagnostics on your own as well. Uh, how to prepare your hive for winter, what equipment you can use, what things you need to remove or move around in your hive, that sort of thing, and when to feed and when to inspect during the winter and beforehand. So bees in winter, that's a common misconception that bees hibernate. They don't actually hibernate and they're actually pretty active inside the cluster during winter. Um, we'll get into exactly what they're doing in the cluster later on, but they're not really sleeping. They're active, they're running around, they're cleaning things, they're caring for brood, they're eating. So they, they do need those resources and they are fairly active. Um, in Western Oregon, where we are here, humidity is far more dangerous than cold. Bees are exceptionally good at regulating their temperature, but they're not very good at expelling moisture. So ventilation is something that's really important that I'm gonna be pushing today. Depending on where you live and what beekeeper you're talking to, you may have some different opinions about wrapping the hive, creating ventilation, but I'm talking about specifically here in the Willamette Valley. And ventilation is the mantra I'm really going to be pushing. Mm -hmm. So winter losses can be quite severe. We've had years where reports are about 60% losses. This year has been a little bit better. Um, the 2022 season looks like the Willamette Valley wins out uh, over Oregon as a whole, we only had 21% losses reported, which is phenomenal, uh, especially with furrow mites and everything going on. Uh, statewide, Oregon's losses averaged about 30% for 2023, and these are figures coming from Dewey Caron. He uh, runs the Pacific Northwest Honeybee Loss Survey and has done so for the last several decades. So definitely check out his website. He's got lots of excellent information. And he's pretty good about emailing back if you've got questions too. So you can feel free to email him as well. So I think every single one of my classes has this slide. So you can look it up on any of the classes I have on the YouTube page. But this is one of my favorite pages out of the Beekeeper's Handbook. Um, it takes into consideration ambient temperatures outside and what's going on in your colony as that is going on. Um, as I said before, the bees are very good at thermal regulation. They can keep the temperature basically where they want it, but they're going to consume more resources, the more difference in temperature in the cluster versus ambient temperatures. So bee behavior moving into winter, populations are going to really begin to decline in late August. Your bees are considering that they are going to have to have a lot of mouths to feed with not a lot of resources coming in. So your peak summer population is around 60,000 bees strong. So two brew boxes and probably a couple of honeysuckers. Going into winter, population should be around 15,000 or half of this. Uh, drones are being expelled from the hive, so that accounts for about 10% of your population. Your workers are not coming in as fast. Your queen is slowing down on her egg laying, preparing for fewer mouths to feed in the winter time. Depending on breed of honeybees, you're going to see some differences here though. As you get into it a little bit more and you experiment with the different breeds, you'll notice that battalions are going to stay larger for longer. Carniolans are going to slow down and become smaller. And it's easier for them to get through winter because they go through with smaller numbers. But you also have to take into consideration that you need them to be large enough to, con to control the temperature. Mm. Um, so fall brood, the brood that's being raised right now or is, is uh, coming to maturity, they are the super bees. They're actually physiologically different than your uh, summer bees. Mm -hmm. Your summer bees are gonna live somewhere between 60 days and six weeks. Your winter bees are going to live all winter long. Yeah. So the winter or fat bees, um, 
when you put them on a, on a scanner, you can actually see they've got a lot more fat stores, a lot more vitiligelin. So they're going to be going through the winter living on these fat stores, mm -hmm. which is why it's super important to feed all of your protein this time of year. So can I ask a question? When you say Absolutely. larger, when you're saying larger, smaller, you meant numbers of feeds or the physical feed itself? That's large. a good question. So when I'm talking about larger and smaller, I'm actually talking about both. Um, the population size is getting much smaller going into winter and the physical size of the bee is not changing. It's what's inside the bee that's changing. Okay. So you're going to have bees that look identical, but are going to be skinny versus fat. Okay. So the fat stores are much larger. And so kind of blubbery. referencing Italian, the Italians mm -hmm. and the carnivores, are they the same kind of The Italians are going to have larger colony sizes going through the winter. Okay. They um, originate from warmer climates. Yeah. The Carniolans are from colder climates and they're more apt to go through winter with smaller uh, clusters because they know that the winters where they come from are longer, so they need fewer mouths to feed going through winter. Thank you. So in October, we're at the beginning of October right now, brood laying and rearing stops. Depending again which breed you have, you may have it stop at a different point, but you should see it really slowing down and actually stopping at this time of the month. Um, this allows the bees to lower the temperature in the colony uh, when you have brood in the colony, 93 degrees is about where they need to be so that they can raise that brood and actually have it um, develop. 85 degrees is closer to what they're going to be keeping the cluster at during winter in a broodless condition. So this also contributes to less resources being used because of keeping the colony a little cooler. This is another fun slide. I definitely recommend taking a photo of it or looking back at YouTube later to read it. Not going to spend too much time on it, but it's just kind of a fun read um, describing kind of how the drones are expelled from the hive from a personified standpoint. Interesting, but a little bit violent. <laughs> <laughs> um, so clustering behavior, what's going on inside the hive as your cluster is going through winter and you are unable to access it. You can't really see this because if you open it up, you break the shell, you run the risk of chilling the bees and really doing some serious damage. So this is things, the things you're not really going to be seeing. It's uh, things that the researchers have been working on. They've been putting um, uh, modes of measuring the temperature inside the colony and kind of figuring out what's going on in here. As your bees begin to cluster, they have an outer shell formed of probably two inches or so, I would guess, of uh, honeybees. They're all facing inward. So their abdomens are out, their heads are in, and they're all about touching. The fur on their thorax is going to create a layer of nice warm air, and it won't be able to escape. Mm -hmm. So essentially, you've got a core of bees surrounding your cluster, keeping everybody nice and warm. And then inside the active cluster, it's a lot looser. There are bees moving around, doing things, uh, cleaning up, uh, feeding everybody, basically just doing bee stuff in there. So your outer shell is nice and tight, your active cluster is doing their thing, and when there is brood in the cluster that is centralized and always about the same temperature, around 93 degrees. Um, depending on the outside temperature, this is kind of interesting, the cluster can expand or contract to maintain the desired temperature. So the colder it is, the smaller your cluster. The warmer it is, the, the larger your cluster, and they may actually break cluster or move the cluster to get to different resources. But through and through, your cluster is going to actively move up through the hive. So in the fall, right around now, when you're looking at getting your hive ready for winter, you want the cluster to be in the lower box. They're not going to move down during winter to access resources. So if you've got honey below them, they're not going to get that honey. It's just going to be kind of a waste. So the cluster stays in the bottom and slowly moves up throughout the winter. So that means what you're saying is that anything you feed should be above them. Anything so you feed should be above them, yeah. yes. So they need to be in the very bottom box of yep. clusters. So the honey or the mm -hmm. sugar, these are the patties, all the all need to be above them. So exactly. Them okay. And then as we go through the slides, we're going to be talking about hive configuration, moving things around to get things in the proper orientation. Right. Um, as bees are clustering, 
they are shivering inside. The inner bees are doing the active moving. They can actually de detach their wings and shiver around their, around their wing spots and create quite a bit of warmth. So this warmth does create condensation, which means you really need extra ventilation. So when you say they detach their wings, do they attach them back? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, so they back and forth. Well, it's kind of a new thing I've been learning, but my understanding is kind of like a snake detaching its jaw. Oh, gotcha. So they can use their shoulders to shiver and create. Hmm. Hmm. So top reasons bees die over winter. This is quite a bit of information. So this is just the, the basic points here. Varroa is the top cause for bee death. Ever since 93, I believe, when varroa mites were introduced to this part of the country. Um, varroa mites are far and away the top reason problems die over winter. So proper treatment in season is really going to dictate whether or not they're going to survive. Uh, excess moisture is definitely um, a number two here. Too much moisture, too warm of a winter can cause all sorts of problems. You don't want cold moisture on the cluster or they won't be able to handle it. Uh, dysentery due to poor ventilation or inability to uh, go on short cleansing flights is a problem too. Uh, they essentially can't really, they can't eat anything anymore and have it do anything good. So with dysentery, you'll see all sorts of symptoms. You'll see fecal streaking on the front of the hive. Um, other things happen with it too. Typically chalk food and things like that will start to appear. Uh, but good ventilation will really help with that. And then rain covers over the top of the hive. If you see in this picture, there's just a little piece of wood on the, the top cover here, weighted down probably with a rock beneath the snow. This gives the bees a little bit of a flyway so they can go out and relieve themselves in the middle of winter. So even if it's raining, they can go outside, go to the bathroom, go back in. And this will really help with your dysentery problems. Uh, another top reason uh, bees die over winter, if the cluster is too small, if they are using too much energy to heat the cluster and they won't be able to survive because there's going to be way too much food they're going to need. Uh, starvation is another one. Starvation can happen in the box full of honey. So it's, it's a difficult scenario watching your bees starve to death in a box full of honey. If it's too cold, the cluster can't move. So if your honey is in the wrong position, they can completely pass it by. And that, that's about all you can do is just keep the honey in the right position. So as they're going up, they hit the honey. Right. Too cold, too long, and the cluster can't move. Mm. So going into a tiny bit more detail here, um, if varroa populations are too high in the fall, we're looking for that right now. We're doing our last treatments right now before winter sets in. Um, disease and reduced wings, uh, lifespan of winter bees can cause ultimate colony collapse. Varroa is the beginning of the problems and they cause all these other problems to uh, eventually cause the colony collapse. Excess moisture due to uh, poor ventilation and wet winters. Um, as I mentioned before, dysentery, chalk brood, nosema is something that usually looks like dysentery, but is actually quite a bit more serious. Difficult to identify and it actually requires, um, it, it requires you to cut open the bee to actually see the insides to determine if it's actually just dysentery or nosema. So basically we treat dysentery and nosema in the same way. Uh, cluster is too small to retain heat and perform essential tasks. Typically, eight to 10 solid frames of bees is a good sized cluster, and they should be able to make it through the winter as long as it's not too cold or too long. Uh, supplemental feeding can also help with this. Broodless cluster, as I said before, must be kept at about 85 degrees. After the solstice, brood rearing begins and the cluster must be kept at 93 degrees. So in probably uh, January, February, that's when your bees are most at risk because they are actually growing. They are keeping their colony at a higher temperature and they're consuming more resources. So that's when you really need to start looking at them. Go, hey, are we getting through the winter? Do we need extra supplemental feed? This is when you need to start paying more attention in winter. Mm -hmm. Starvation, talked about this briefly, but can be caused by too much honey taken too late in the season. Um, if you're going to take honey and you know they're going to build up, that's fine. Um, Typically, I like to harvest my honey the last week of July, 
sometimes it's not all right. So you have to wait an extra week or two, but last week of July is when you really want to be taking it because that gives you the opportunity to treat the first or second week of August and then do a final treatment in late September or October. Um, you can also take the honey and harvest it later. So if you've got a couple of boxes full of honey, freeze it, harvest it later. You don't have to harvest then, you just have to take it early enough. And then that gives all the bees also time to uh, bring in more forage and cure more honey before winter. And you have to freeze it if you take it early? If you take the honey early, you don't necessarily have to freeze it, but you do have to protect it from robbers. So other bees will want to rob the honey, ants will want to rob the honey, yeah. all sorts of things. Okay. So, so that's why you may even freeze it though. Exactly. Oh, okay. okay. Um, feeding protein in fall is key. Uh, a lot of the times in late summer, early fall, there's not very many resources around. If it's too hot, a lot of the nectar and pollen resources will have gone away. If it's too cold and rainy, then the bees don't have very many opportunities to get out. So whether or not you're having a good year, it's a good idea to throw a protein patty into the colony and just see how much they consume. If they're consuming the entire protein patty, continue to feed. If they're not consuming the whole protein patty, you can cut the patty up, you can make it smaller. I just like to have a little piece in to know exactly how much they're consuming because you really don't want them to be running out of protein, particularly when they're raising the super bees for winter. Feeding during winter. Uh, the best approach, of course, is lots of protein in August or September, and you wanna leave plenty of honey. Uh, usually 60 to 80 pounds of honey is going to get them through the winter. That's that's the goal for around here. Can you ask me a question? Mm -hmm. The pollen that you put in the pollen pattern, does it go bad? Is that why if they're not eating it a lot, you take some out? Or could you just leave it there? Okay, I'm not okay sure that's a good question. Or not leaving. So the idea with leaving protein patties in the colony, even if they're not consuming it, is just a gauge. If you're leaving a small strip in and they don't eat it, eventually after probably about, I'd say about two weeks, it starts to get kind of liquidy and they're not really going to consume it anymore. So I'd scrape it out and throw it away. If they're consuming it all, you just continue putting that much in. Yeah. If they're, okay. they're eating it. So it's a gauge and then it does go bad. Yes, and eventually it goes bad. But it's pretty obvious if it's gone bad. It's kind of gushy and liquidy okay. and it's pretty easy to scrape out with your hive tool at that point. Sure, thank you. Um, as far as testing the weight of your colony, um, this is not rocket science. You can get technical about it. There are hive scales out there, but a lot of people, especially the hobbyists, really aren't out there to go spending a bunch of money on hive scales and doing really technical work. So half the back of your hive every couple of days or every week or so, and just feel the difference in the weight. And you'll know, are they getting lighter? Or are they getting heavier? This is gonna tell you a lot. Um, hopefully at this point, you should be kind of on an even keel. They're still bringing some in. You should still be feeding uh, probably for the next, probably for the next week or two, I'm still gonna be feeding my sugar syrup. But as the temperatures begin to drop, I'm gonna stop feeding my liquid syrup. Um, protein supplements in the winter months. So you don't want to be using your active season protein patty in the winter because you're going to approve this period. The uh, active protein season, please. when you're going into the winter season, you're going to be changing your protein. Okay. Active season protein patties are about 18% protein mm -hmm. and winter patties are about 4% protein. Mm -hmm. So you still got all the nutrients and the sugars and everything that you need, but you have fewer proteins, which is not going to force your queen to lay. Too much protein means brood. Um, so when you're going through your winter months, you don't want to force your queen to lay. By winter months, are you saying like or? I'm yeah. going to start feeding my winter patties going into winter, probably at the end of October. Mm -hmm. This is about the time you should see your queen starting to kind of, kind of lay off on laying. Uh, at this point, you may see some eggs still in the hive, and that's okay, but you should be seeing significantly less eggs. Uh, carbohydrate feeding in winter or your sugar feeding. Uh, dry granulated sugar or fondant cakes in the winter time is the only thing you're going to be feeding. You're going to be stopping your liquid feed. Uh, typically, daytime temperatures below 55 degrees. They can't really uh, consume the liquid sugar. They can't process it too much moisture. So when they're not processing it, that sugar syrup is just staying in the hive producing extra moisture, which is what we're trying to avoid with all of our ventilation. 
So uh, dry sugar is completely fine. As you can see in the photos here, just sprinkle it on top of the, on top of the frames. Um, fondant cakes are fine as well. You can find all sorts of YouTube videos on how to make those. And you can put those directly on top of the frames or you can put them on some newspaper, kind of make it a little bit cleaner. Is that what the Pro Winter is? The Pro Winter is your uh, winter patty for uh, protein. So this is your 4% protein. Okay. So you can and, do both. Hmm? You can do both. Uh, you'll do just your winter protein and your sugar. So you've got protein and carbohydrates here. Do you, know, do you sell the winter protein? We do sell the winter protein here. Um, we can't get it in small containers, so the 10-pound tub is the smallest that I have. <laughs> it will last you a couple of years. <laughs> oh, well, there we go. <laughs> um, and then, obviously, we don't hold the high card. Is this something that's on a ball board? Or that's a good question. Check? So winter feeding is a little bit complicated because you can't take the hive apart when it's too cold. So that's why beekeepers become meteorologists. <laughs> so just check, take a look at the weather every day or so, and you're looking for warm enough periods in order to feed. So uh, emergency winter feed happens when you have a nice day, no rain, not too much wind, and it's above 55 degrees. You want to keep your visits really short. You want to go in, feed, and go out. So it should take no more than about five to 10 minutes when you go in to feed during winter. And last winter was not great for emergency feeding. I got two opportunities all winter long. So that was from October until about February. Yeah, it was nasty. It was. It was normal, really. Yes. For the staff. But that's why you've really got to keep an eye on the right. weather is because you're not going to get very many opportunities to really do your emergency feed. Yeah. Quick question. Absolutely. I don't know the proper term, but the ventilation portion of on top of your food box is still on. You just pull a roof and put your sugar in there, or you know, it's got to go oh, on. Actually, the that's the next slide right here. So the question was, where do you feed your sugar? And the answer is, it depends on who you talk to. <laughs> <laughs> Again, what yes. I'm talking about. Everybody's got a different story. So everybody's got a different story. Some people do use their ventilation cover or their Vivaldi inner cover, and they put the sugar up there. The problem with that is the cluster has to break in order to access that sugar. So they have to break, move up, eat, and then go back down. If it's too cold, they can't really do that. So what I like to do is uh, this photo over here on the right, I will sprinkle my sugar directly on top of the frames. And as I'm doing that, some of the sugar inevitably is going to fall on top of the bees as well. They'll clean it off of each other. They can actually get to it because they're it's basically on top of them. Um, so it's just a little bit more accessible when you put it on top of the frames like this. So you're literally just spring, sprinkling yep. uh, sugar, white sugar. Exactly. Table, table sugar. sugar. Just on them and it goes on them. It doesn't hurt them. It right. actually helps them. Mm -hmm. It has a good quantity. It kind of depends. you got to feel it out. Um, you want to put enough on there that if you don't get an opportunity to feed in the next couple of weeks, they're not going to run out. But you don't want to put too much on there because the sugar will take in the moisture and eventually you've got wet sugar on there, which can be a problem too. So I usually fill about three or four frames. I've got five frames here, but enough that they'll be able to consume it, but not too much. So are you putting sugar on each frame or just? Yeah. I'm putting sugar on top of the cluster. So the frames on the side don't have any of these. Oh, frame. This, sorry, uh -huh. I'm taking no, I'm thinking boxes. I'm gotcha. not thinking frames. I'm sorry. You want to get it as close to the cluster as possible, but you don't want to take the boxes apart. So I always put it on the top box. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. And that stuff at the top is that protein? Yes, this is your winter protein. The winter protein patties are about the consistency of cookie dough. So you use your hive tool to dig it out and spread it on. Mm -hmm. So that's not the same thing as the pollen patty. The pollen patty and the winter protein are very similar. Okay, the but they're not the same though. They're, they're not exactly the same. The okay. difference is the percentage of protein in each. That's what you're saying. I got it. Thank you. Sorry. No worries. Uh, looks like I've got a couple questions in chat here. Uh, question about moisture. Can you use moisture absorbers in the hive, like what is in food packaging? Mm -hmm. Yes, we actually do have compressed fiber boards. So you would put the compressed fiber board on top of your Vivaldi or your Jacobson cover. Um, usually that lasts about a couple of weeks. It does get wet eventually, and it can do more harm than good if it can't get in and flip that over to the dry side or remove it and replace it with another. 
So you can use that. You can use all sorts of different things. Uh, the cool thing about the quilt box or the Vivaldi inner cover is that you can use whatever kind of moisture absorbers you can. You can use um, unbleached wool, you can use burlap, you can use an old beach towel, you can use the compressed fiberboard, uh, anything that'll soak up the moisture and keep it in there. But when you're going into feed, you wanna make sure that that hasn't been completely saturated. And if it has, you need to remove it and replace it with something new. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so you're, sorry, you're saying that you would put that towel as an example mm -hmm. on the, like, the top left picture instead of the sugar and all that there. That's yes. where you put your, mm -hmm. and then you lift that up and put your sugar on the things. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. That doesn't inhibit any ventilation if you put it like in that top cover. You do want some air in there. You don't want it to be completely pressed down. Um, the cool thing about the compressed fiber board is it actually sits on top of the Vivaldi inner cover. So the vents are on the side. The, the moisture could come up, vent out, but anything that doesn't vent out hits that compressed fiber board. This one can leave the corners open. Yep, the corners should still be open. If you're putting wool in there or burlap or something, make sure it's not completely smashed in there and that the, the moisture can still come up and vent out. It has the opportunity to vent outwards or soak into the material. So it sounds like you want it to be crumpled, kind of like a foil, like yes. a crumpled foil, and so it gives enough pockets mm -hmm. for air to go through. Yep, okay. exactly. Um, got another question in chat. Uh, what concentration of liquid sugar syrup do I use in fall? Another good question. Um, I always use a two to one sugar concentration for fall feeding. And the reason I do this is because they'll actually store it in the frames. So you're putting weight onto your colony when you're doing this. Um, if you've got a light colony, you're worried about how many stores they've got going into winter, feed, feed, feed. They'll continue taking it. They'll continue storing that sugar syrup. Um, also a reason that you don't feed during honey superings because you'll wind up with sugar syrup in your honey. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we're good on questions in chat for now. So much for bees doing their own thing. You, <laughs> you see on the beekeeping web, you know, page on the Facebook thing mm -hmm. that everybody says, oh, some people say, oh, the bees will do it themselves. I mean, people do too much, you know, it doesn't really sound like that. There are earth. a lot of things that are very different about actually beekeeping in a box versus wild bees. Well, beekeeping, correct. Mm -hmm. I mean, I uh, for instance, the boxes we use are dead wood. Whereas colonies out in the wild are always in live trees. Yes. So that makes a big difference too. Oh, yeah. um, Varroa mites have really changed the game before they could really survive in nature and do their own thing. Mm -hmm. Once Varroa mites were introduced, they still haven't evolved to handle this new pest. Mm -hmm. And so they don't really make it in the wild. The mm -hmm. wild bees you're seeing right now are mostly splits or swarms from, from animal husbandry. Oh, that's sad. Yeah. But they're still out there yeah. and in really remote areas they can survive um, typically bees will forage around three miles from their hive so if they're 10 miles from any other hive they don't have the influence of furrow mites and pathogens and things moving around so it is possible for them to survive in the wild if they don't come into contact with any bees who have been compromised mm -hmm. so if you have a partially full honey super that you leave on top should you take out the main excluder Excellent question. If you've got a partially full honey uh, honey super and you want to leave it on for winter, should you take out the queen excluder? Um, the answer is you shouldn't ever go through winter with a queen excluder on because as the colony moves up to get the, the resources, you run the risk of leaving your queen behind. They're going to go for the resources. If they don't, they, they can't feed, but they want the queen to be around. So you have to make them choose. Do we want the food or do we want the queen? So usually it ends up with the problems down the road. You know, queenless in spring. Um, queens aren't generally available until probably Marchish. And if you're losing your queen as the colony moves up, you should be getting um, you you should have brood beginning in January, February. So you're missing out on a lot of population, and chances are the colony will die before spring. Mm -hmm. So no queen excluders. Um, if you don't want them in your honey super, remove the honey super and you can feed the frames in spring. So take those frames, freeze them, and then feed them in spring. Um, but you you really can't use a queen excluder in the time. So right. Neil, you're saying that the queen goes up with the colony as they go to feed, they mm -hmm. can leave them behind. Yep, the so queen is always in the center of the cluster. Okay, okay. thank you. 
unless she's left behind because there's no food right. she can get. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you you want the queen in the closet exactly. at all times. Yep. She can't survive on her own. She has to have her entourage and her cluster around her to yeah. regulate her temperature and feed her and basically do everything for her. She doesn't do much. She yeah, just lays it. <laughs> Uh, so moisture control, getting a little bit more in-depth here about different equipment you can use for moisture control. Um, I don't think I have a picture of the compressed fiber board, but we do have those in the B department. Um, ventilation, again, I'm, I'm just going to beat a dead horse here. Ventilation is the most important thing you can do for winter in this area of the Willamette Valley. Um, don't wrap or seal your hive. Usually, um, if you're super, super deep in snow, you're somewhere up in Canada, you're in Montana, you're getting feet and feet of snow, you can probably get away with wrapping your hive then and keeping them a little bit warmer, but you still have to make sure it's not a complete wrap. They've got ventilation as well. Um, but here, we don't recommend wrapping or sealing the hive at all and just going ventilation all the way. The Vivaldi inner cover in the top photo here is the same uh, container you use for feeding in the springtime. So just remove your feeder, put your moisture wicking materials in here, and you're set for ventilation for the winter. Especially if you're uh, beekeeping on the coast where you're really concerned about moisture, the bottom photo here is of a Jacobson moisture board. And you'll see if you can't actually use a feeder with this because it is a full screen, but this allows the maximum amount of moisture to flow up into this box and out through the sides. So if you're in a really moist area, this could really help your colony. Um, towards the end of October, we're going to start seeing winter temperatures. When daytime temperatures are 55 degrees or below, you're not going to be doing any sugar syrup feeding. Mm -hmm. um, you also can't open your hive when it's that cold. So 55 degrees or above, you can get into do emergency feed. If it's colder than that, the best thing you can do is just let them to their own devices. That's so question. How do we know when we need food? Um, that's actually a really good question. How do you know when they need food? Uh, this takes me back to the 60 or 80 pounds roughly that they need through winter and to hefting the back of the hive. It sounds silly and it sounds like, well, how do I know? I have the back of the hive. I don't know how, how heavy that is. Half the back of the hive every week or two and just notice the difference. Honey is incredibly heavy, whereas brood or empty comb is pretty light. If you've got an empty box, I've got the demonstration hive uh, in the bee department, half the back of that hive and feel just how light it is because it's got nothing in it. Your hive, you shouldn't be able to lift at all. Oh. And again, even if they are hungry, if it's below 55 degrees, you can't really do much. So wait until you get the opportunity, 55 degrees or up, nice warm day, um, pop your head in and see if they've got any leftover food, um, emer emergency food that you put in before. If they don't have any emergency food left in, throw in some more. Or if the emergency food looks a little bit moist, sometimes the winter patties can kind of melt. Take that out and put new stuff in. Uh, some beekeepers will tilt the hive very slightly so that the entrance faces down and drains collecting water down the front wall and away from the cluster. By tilting slightly, I mean very slightly. You can take an extra entrance reducer and prop it on the back of the hive. That way you've got the, the, the entrance facing forward, moisture goes up, collects on the top, then water takes the path of least resistance, so it goes down and then out. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't drop directly on your cluster, it completely circumvents the cluster when it goes out. Um, you have to remember to level the hive again in spring when you're beginning to feed your one-to-one -one sugar syrup and really ramp up wax production, because if the colony is tilted, they're going to build their wax tilted too. <laughs> That's going to cause some trouble. Honey's going to chill out. <laughs> there, there are all sorts of problems with an upper level hive. So in winter, it's okay, but as soon as spring hits, make sure it's level again. Um, don't forget to check the quality of existing hive equipment. Um, if you're going in and doing fall inspections and you've noticed, oh, I've been working with my hive tool to separate these boxes, this little hole right here, mm -hmm. patch that up, fix it, get a new box, do whatever you need to do, make sure that no rain is going to be getting in. Um, splitting hive bodies, talked about that, large cracks getting between boxes, get the failing equipment fixed before winter sets in. Uh, winter is a great time to patch up any equipment that you've removed. So remove old equipment, put new equipment in, patch up the old stuff, and suddenly you've got uh, extra hive equipment so that you can split next spring. 
So I have a question regarding the rainy season. Is there any reason why you can't set up like a lean to with, I mean, not on the high directly, but just mm -hmm. behind it? Like, you know, your rain usually helps from certain That's direction. That's a good question. Just make a, a real unfancy lean to, mm -hmm. you know, a little top and, and back so the rain doesn't just come directly all the time. Mm -hmm. Would that help? That would absolutely help. Um, mm -hmm. So, Building a construction that would help block the wind and block the rain yeah. is definitely helpful. If you put a little lean to behind the hive, you know the wind is always coming in a specific direction. Mm -hmm. That gives them a flyway so that they can go out and do their um, their cleansing flights, use the bathroom outside the hive because they'll yeah. have it otherwise. So that kind of takes the place mm -hmm. of the one that's in the front. So mm -hmm. it's a little one that gets the flyaway. Yep. Yeah. That helps a lot. Yeah. A yeah. lot of people actually do that. Okay. Some people get really creative. Some people do a pretty rudimentary job of it. I mean, just yeah. a metal plate or something like that will work. Okay. But I've seen some really cute ones too. Yeah. How far away from the hive should it be, do you believe? Like, can it be like just a couple feet away? Yeah. It can be a couple feet away from the hive. It can be directly on top of the hive. Okay. Um, I've seen a metal sheet actually curved around a hive and kind of tied to it just as a wind block as well. Okay. So as long as the hive can still breathe and ventilate, then you're absolutely fine. Awesome. Entrance reducers. Entrance yeah. reducers. No. <laughs> so okay. entrance she reducers are simple, but right? oh, this, is, gonna be on this is all going to be on YouTube, so you okay. can you can there. copy it all as well. There you go. Um, so entrance reducers do have a correct orientation, particularly in winter. Summertime, it doesn't matter so much because the hive is active, mortician bees are moving around, cleaning out the bottom boards. During winter, when it's really cold, the cluster can't move too much. They can only move about maybe a couple of inches a day. Um, so bees are not immortal. Even though you're clustering and you've got a lot of your super bees who are going to live quite a bit longer, there is still normal die-off. So the bottom board is going to be littered with dead bees, which is totally normal. Don't worry about it. Um, but having the entrance reducer with the incorrect orientation can actually trap your bees inside. So make sure that the entrance on your entrance reducer is facing up and not down. Yeah, opposite, yeah. And varroa mites. Okay. Nobody likes to hear about it, but it's something we got to talk about. Um, if you're seeing deformed wing virus in your hive, it's a little bit on the late side now, but you can still treat. Temperatures will still allow you to treat with uh, formic acid. You can probably still do an apic guard. Um, it's getting to the point where it's pretty late. So if you see deformed wing virus, do that now. We still have the chance. Um, the best scenario for mite control is integrated pest management throughout the year. So you will be treating in spring, summer, and fall, and using a variety of different treatments. If you're using natural treatments, um, it's more likely that the varroa mites will not become resistant versus if you're using chemical things like apiflar. So um, after establishing a nucleot package or bringing your colony through winter, you're going to be doing your first treatment. That's going to be probably April or May. And this is all weather dependent. So a couple of weeks either way. Um, you're going to be doing another one directly after honey flow. And that's going to be probably first or second week of August. Another reason we try and harvest the honey early is so that we can get that mite treatment on. Um, when you do this early mite treatment, that allows you to have a second mite treatment. So you've got two treatments from the end of honey harvest uh, to the beginning of winter here. Um, before wintering, late September, early October. So right around now, you should be finishing up or uh, applying your mite treatments. And if you're going to be treating in winter, a lot of people do, a lot of people don't, but you can't use the summer mite treatments during winter because a lot of them have temperature requirements. Oxalic acid um, is really the only thing you can actually use effectively in the winter, and it should be used on a broodless cluster. So it should be used ideally um, probably a little bit before January, honestly, sometime in December. You can do a vaporization or a drip but you do require lots of personal protective equipment. If you're doing the vaporization, it is quite expensive to have all the equipment. Um, if you go to your local beekeepers association, you'll probably find a couple people who do have the equipment and can help you out. Mm. Um, another thing to note is there's a lot of oxalic acid out there on the market. 
Technically speaking, there's only one that's legal to use on a honeybee colony, and that is apibioxal. A little more on the expensive side, but it has been certified, it's gone through all the right channels. It's what you should be using if you're using oxalic acid. Quick question. Uh -huh. uh, I put my reading glasses on. I'm always looking at my bees. When they show a picture here, they're always showing that huge mite on the bees. Mm -hmm. I've never seen any mites on my bees. Uh, it's now, actually really uncommon to see mites on the bees. The pictures make it look like they're ten percent the size mm -hmm. of a bee. You know, they're huge. I mean, considering bees. I wonder why you can't see them. Usually, when you see mites on top of the bees, that's a pretty bad sign. Typically, the mites are going to go to more protected locations. They're going to be on the underside of the bee. And really, what they want to be is they want to be inside the brood cell. So you're not really going to see mites on the backs of bees unless they are in the process of traveling. So the way the mites get to the colony is they hang out on a flower or on another bee that, uh, that visits a flower. They swap from the flower or the other bee to the next bee get carried to the hive and then immediately go into the brood chamber where they where they meet. So on your mic board when I pull it, I mean there's a lot of stuff on there, but I'll see these almost like a needle prick. Mm -hmm. A little red. And I always thought, well, is that a mite? I mean they're very, very small. They are small. And I, you know, I spray it with the pan cooking <laughs> spray. But are those mites I'm seeing those very There is a trick to reading a mite board. When you're looking at your mite board, it's nice to have a flashlight on hand. Um, when you're looking at all the debris on the mite board, you're going to see a lot of matte debris. You're going to see lots of little bits of pollen and debris and bee poop and all sorts of things. Um, if you use a flashlight, the mites are going to be shiny, whereas everything else is going to be matte. Mm -hmm. If you look really closely, we actually got a vial full of mites right here. Um, you can see <laughs> the eight forward facing legs. So it's a small oval disc with eight forward facing legs that you're looking for. Uh, you almost have to get a magnifying glass. Yes. Yeah. That does help actually if you have a little reader magnifying mm -hmm. glass. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to try that. Yeah. Well, we'll look here in a minute. We need one to These are actually really inexpensive. Oh. But just this little glass right here yeah. is really, really handy. It's got the light and everything. Where do you get that? I got ten dollars on Amazon. Okay. So it's not actually show you that. So it's got a light on the side. Glass. Yep. Okay. What would you look for um, on Amazon? What would it be called? Just light, light as a magnifier. This one's just says metal magnifier on it. Thank but you can look at lens, hand lens, all sorts of things. Thanks, man. Sure thing. Um, other winter issues. Okay, so we're looking at sun positions. Some people move their colonies seasonally to have the best location for summer and winter and forage and all these other things. Uh, most of us hobbyists like to be one and done, set the colony up, and that's where it lives forever. Um, if you're like me, then you're doing the same thing. Uh, mice can be an issue, and storage frames and boxes are troublesome over winter, so we'll talk about that as well. So I thought we weren't supposed to move boxes out of position. You can move boxes, but it's a little bit tricky. Right, yeah, but move them a little bit at mm -hmm. a time so that they don't get disoriented. There work. are several ways of doing okay. it. Okay, all right. So <laughs> you don't have to get into it, but you can. Yeah, you okay. can. Um, generally speaking, if you're going to move your colony a couple of feet, move it three inches or so per day, and they won't even really notice. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of work. So mm -hmm. if I'm going to be moving my colony, say, across the yard or something, what I'll do is I'll move it all at once when, they're, um, when they've gone to bed for night. It's still warm enough to move them and to separate them, but it's cool enough they're not going to be flying around as much. Mm -hmm. Put them in position, and then take an old nuke box and put it in the old position. Some of the bees are going to go back to that old location. So that's where you have the nuke box in there, and they're going to collect right there. The next couple of days, you're going to take that nuke box and pour it into the new location of the hive. And eventually, you're not going to have any bees returning to the old location. And you're saying a nuke box, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Or any other swarm catcher or container that the bees will fly. So it has to be above 55, though, because you're moving. Yes. You can't move all the boxes at one time. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. You can, but you don't want to. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> okay, I gotcha. Thank you. Um, let's see. Ooh. Got a shudder every time I see that picture. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that that's actually um, I got some hand-me-down frames, and that was one of the frames, the bottom picture right there. <laughs> so I was actually kind of excited when I saw it because I didn't have a good picture of it. So it's it's good to know what to look for when you're looking at wax moths. This is a really really nasty infestation. And I wound up just wiping this complete frame away and starting it just just the frame with no foundation. The question in the back. I, I when you're using plastic ones, that's pretty good to do. But if you're using wooden ones, you got to really watch because I've noticed they get them way up inside the edges and corners. Yes. So you, can, I had one one time, and I was I just used a um a a heater, like a, a heat gun, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, not even a blowtorch, just a heat gun, and I just make sure to get it up into the corners real, real hard. That's a really good point. It's very satisfying. Mm -hmm. But they, they get, get way up in there where you don't take yes. it out, and, and they, they're tiny at first. The wax moths are really, really difficult to see, and they will actually start to consume the wood itself as well. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's a really good point that you brought up. Even if you take all the wax away and you've got the wooden frame left, that doesn't guarantee all the wax moths are gone. So it is a good idea to mm -hmm. uh, run some heat around it and really kill all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. Or to so freeze. Yeah. Could you freeze them? Absolutely. Freezing is, it seems the most accepted way of getting rid of the wax moths. And so long. If yeah. you freeze the frames for three days, you'll kill all the wax moths and larvae. Okay. Um, if you're going to be freezing and storing, you may want to do freeze and store and then a month or two in freeze and store again, just to keep killing off any eggs that, uh, that wind up in there. Mm -hmm. It's really difficult once you have an infestation to completely eradicate it. Really? Mm -hmm. My garage is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out there's wooden places I never would have thought. <laughs> Um, so long-term storage in the freezer is probably the best option to keep wax moths at bay, but it's expensive and a lot of people don't have the space. Mm -hmm. So the three-day freeze and then store is what most people will go for. And are you saying store mm -hmm. and then go back and get those back out mm -hmm. and freeze them again? It's a good idea to take a look at your frames throughout the winter and just see if there's anything going on in there. If you start seeing any webbing or a caterpillar walking around or signs that that's just not right. Um, you'll see kind of like, almost looks like a slug trail across them. Yeah. Uh, then you'll wanna refreeze them and store them again. If you let the infestation get too bad, like the picture is here, mm -hmm. uh, there's a chance, even if you clean those frames perfectly, set them in the hive, they'll still be rejected. So you wanna keep on top of the wax moth infestation. This, this happened in about two weeks. Oh, wow. Uh, where was I here? So bees will not do with them. In an active colony, they will keep the wax moths at bay. Um, if you have frames that have been severely affected by wax moths, it's possible that they'll reject the frames as being too gross to use. A uh, small wax moth infestation, clean it up a little bit, put it in the hive, chances are pretty good that they will accept the frames. So okay. it's based on severity of infestation. Um, storage of frames. Uh, wax moths cannot copulate in the light. They require dark spaces with little moving air. So good ventilation and good light penetration of your store boxes can really help out. Um, the trouble is if you provide lots of light and lots of ventilation, uh, especially in an area that isn't necessarily completely sealed off to the outside, mice become fraught. <laughs> so you kind of got to figure out which one would I rather deal with here? <laughs> you can also seal them in a completely airtight um, airtight box. But wax moths can get through a hole as big as a paper clip. Mm -hmm. I've seen it happen. <laughs> uh, do you have a question? Well, yes. I just, we took ours out of the freezer. I put it in a trash bag and put it up in the barn. Oh, is that okay to do? Put it in the trash bag and shame them up that way? or As long as they're completely sealed, the trash bag is just fine. Uh, especially if you twist the trash bag and stick it underneath the frames. Mm -hmm. If there's a hole in there, they can get in. But if it's completely sealed, that should be just fine. But I would still take a take a look at them every couple of weeks and just make sure everything still looks good. 
Well, and also you could take those again, like you said, and put them in the freezer for three days and then you store them again. Yes. And you should probably do that right every two weeks or every month. If you start seeing wax moth infestation, then definitely freeze them for three days. If you don't see anything, maybe wait a little while, come back, I look again. Just the jet yes. Whatever. Some beekeepers have incredible luck and they've never seen a wax moth in their lives. Yeah. Some beekeepers just get the short end of the stick. Yeah, uh, yeah. The first year, no wax moths at all. All I had to do was I stacked my boxes. So I've got uh, a box sitting in here and then the box on top, I tilt it so that all four edges can get a little bit of light and keep tilting the boxes all the way up. Uh, you don't want to store too many boxes on top of each other so you still get good light penetration. Um, and this and is storing them. Yes, in wherever storing. you're storing yep. them. Storing them in an empty shed or something. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you could get lucky and not have wax moss at all. You could get unlucky and have to wage war. Mm -hmm. It's really nice to be lucky because I've been unlucky before. <laughs> it's a good learning experience. Um, it absolutely is. Let's see. Just a few frames, airtight container. Yep, talked about this. Um, wax, wax moths are typically attracted to brood frames. The honey frames that have only had stored honey are pretty safe to store. You're mostly just worried about ants and mice at that point. Um, but the brood frames are really what they're going for. So it's a good idea if you have brood frames and honey frames, store them separately as well. I didn't know you could store brood frames. Mm -hmm. oh. But the wax moths love them. Yeah. <laughs> Um, as far as treatment, uh, frames like this basically just toss. Uh, frames that have a mild infestation, you can freeze them and place them again. You can also use uh, paramoth crystals. They smell terrible. They have horrible uh, warnings all over the label, but they're pretty easy to use. When you're using paramoth and you're trying to protect, say, five or six boxes, you should stack boxes about five high. Wrap the boxes, make sure they're completely sealed, put a paper towel on top, and then paramount crystals on top of that. The crystals are heavier than air, and they will sink down and uh, keep wax moths out throughout the season. When you're using the paramount crystals, you do have to allow the boxes to air out in spring before you begin to use them again. If you immediately start using frames that you've had with crystals in them to prevent wax moths, it's actually detrimental to honeybees. So let them air out for a couple of weeks before you use them. And mice, <laughs> especially if you're in a more rural area. So I had a in that picture. <laughs> Our poor cat killed two bats this morning. I was very oh, happy about that. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so mice aren't necessarily interested in killing the bees. They're not super interested in the food stores in there. They're mostly interested in the warmth because honeybees keep their cluster so warm. Um, mice are going in there for the insulation of the wax, the honeybees in there that are shivering to keep warm, but they will destroy quite a bit of comb. And it's pretty obvious when you have a mouse in the colony, you pull a frame out and there's just these tracks all over it and mice droppings and it, it's, a, it's a bad deal. So you wanna make sure that mice can't get in there, uh, especially late in winter as your colony is moving up, the cluster is not going to break if there's a mouse inside, they're just gonna deal with it. Um, so mouse guards like this metal one down here, really easy to install. Two little nails, all you really need will keep the mice out, will keep the ventilation going. So this is a, a good way to go. You can use your entrance reducers as well, as long as you make sure that they are stable in there. Most of the time, if you've had your entrance reducer on small all season long, it's going to be propolized in there and it's gonna be pretty stuck. Um, if you've ever played with propolis before, it's pretty malleable in summertime, but in wintertime, it's rock. So if you got it propolized in there, you're not really terribly worried. Um, if a mouse dies inside the hive during the summer, kind of interesting. The bees can't move the mouse, but the mouse does provide extra moisture. So they'll actually flap their wings around it and they will take all the moisture out of the mouse and effectively mummify it. Mm. Never actually seen it before, but my mentor said it's pretty interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Um, cats can help. Uh, mowing around your hive can help too. If you've got a bunch of long grasses around there, 
it's going to be more inviting. So keep a, a nice area clean around the hive and that'll help as well. A lot of people ask me about mold, um, especially midwinter. They're looking at a dead out. They're like, oh gosh, the mold killed my hive. This is incredibly unlikely as mold is usually a symptom of colony death and not a cause. Um, bees are typically very clean. We breed them to be clean. They are kind of clean anyhow. They won't tolerate mold in their colony. So if mold is happening in the dead out, it's simply because the bees have died and they've stopped cleaning. So you um, discovered dead out kind of in the winter. What, what are your next steps? Like, like that's an excellent question. <laughs> if I found a dead out in winter, uh, my next steps, um, depending on weather, mm -hmm. what you'd want to do is honestly the best way to store the dead out in winter is just to keep it where it is. Okay. Uh, you want to seal it off because you don't want mice getting in there. You don't want any bees or uh, insects or anything getting in there. So I like to use uh, duct tape or gorilla tape or something like that to completely seal the hive. Mm -hmm. um, you would do that after a quick inspection, kind of figure out why did these bees die? What happened? How many resources are in the hive? Um, you can tell oh, a lot of causes of mortality just by looking at frames with bees in there. If you take out a couple of frames, you've got three frames of bees and they're all just kind of clustered together. They probably were too small mm -hmm. and they froze to death. If there are many bees on empty frames and they're all inside the, the cells, usually that leads to starvation. Um, if you're seeing brood that's been abandoned, that can cause uh, a little bit more trouble and is a little bit more difficult to identify in winter, but brood diseases are possible as well. Mm -hmm. um, you can actually send frames into OSU and they'll help you identify it. Okay. So you will leave it in in its location. Yes. And um, then when you go deal with it, um, you just go deal with it. <laughs> so you would clean out the hive in spring, mm -hmm. uh, leave it where it sits, make sure it's completely yeah. sealed. And then when you're ready to put new bees in there, you unseal it, you take all the frames out. There's probably going to be some mold. You may have to scrape some wax off of the frames, mm -hmm. um, air it out a little bit, um, fix anything that has okay. been uh, destroyed or really moldy or okay. things like that. But most of the time, is unless it is a really nasty brood disease, like American fall brood or European fall brood, you can reuse that hive the next year. Okay. And then just one last question. Mm -hmm. if I, is that a thing here? Is that prevalent here, American fall brood? American fall brood is not common here, but it does exist here. Uh -huh. So it's important to know the different tests that you can run mm -hmm. to know the difference between American and European fall brood because they are very similar. Mm -hmm. European fall brood, you can use the frames again. American fall brood, you have to either just can the entire hive or you dig a deep pit, you put all of your equipment in there and you sear it all with fire. Mm -hmm. So it's really important when you're looking for American fall brood if you've got a really good nose, you can tell the difference in the smells. I don't, so I can't really help you out with that. Um, but when you're looking at the brood, it's what's called the ropey test. You yeah. take a toothpick or something, stir up the brood, and then if you stretch it, and it stretches over an inch, it's probably going to be an American fall brood. Mm -hmm. There are other ways to identify it too, but typically the frames are pretty difficult to see. And mm -hmm. if you're unsure, it's a good idea to get uh, professional help. OSU is really good about that. If you have the plastic frames, can they be sterilized? Or? The frames typically, uh, in the case of American Fowl Brew, you just scrap all the frames and you'll reuse the boxes after it's been seared. With That's plastic it. frames, I think you just have to get rid of them. The um, spores of American Fowl Brew, I think, can last, I think it was 60 to 80 years, something like that. So it's it's pretty nasty, but it's far less prevalent now than it has been in the past. So that that's at least lucky. I am happy to be focused on burrow mites rather than American fall brood. I've found dead outs in the middle of winter, and I tend to take them and put them in the freezer for a couple of days, mm -hmm. and then put them somewhere where it's dry because I don't want them to mold. Mm -hmm. If you find it in the spring, the mold really. Yeah, it gets yeah. pretty bad. Yeah. 
So right. that's another good thing that you can do is if you find a dead out and you see that you you have good frames, you can freeze the frames and store the frames like we talked about for uh, storage for wax moss. I do have a question. Mm -hmm. um, I have open bottoms, just screen bottoms mm -hmm. on my, and I'm wondering when, you know, you, if you use those, you put a board underneath, like I'll slide a board in where you would put the uh, mic boards or something, or if you could just put a mic board in there to keep wind. So that's a really good question too. Uh, the question was, if you have a screen bottom board, at what point or when do you insert the mic board in there to uh, create a warmer environment? And again, this really depends on who you ask. A lot of beekeepers will insert the mic board for extra warmth, especially when it becomes really cold. I typically tend to leave my mic board completely out and have my screen bottom board completely open throughout the winter. Um, extra ventilation, the cluster itself is very, very good at thermal regulation, so I don't really worry too much about their heat. I'm more worried about uh, ventilation. Mm -hmm. So if it's if it's the ice storm that we had last year, I put the mic board in, but otherwise I leave the mic board uh, out and leave that bottom completely open. But that's my opinion. <laughs> um, as far as moldy frames, most of the time moldy frames, as long as there's no brood disease, can be reused. Um, you can scrape them if they're really nasty. You can freeze them um, and then insert them back into the colony. If you're using kind of yucky frames, you're not really sure about it, use a couple of new frames and a couple of moldy frames and just see whether or not they take. Um, because if the frames are too bad, it is possible that these will reject them and you'll have to remove them at a later time. So keep an eye on them if you're trying. Spray just vinegar on lightly on them. I suppose you could, but vinegar is too high. Killing children, mildew, and mold. That's what I use on my counter. And it does wonderful. Look into that. 5% strength, of course. No, no lower, but that's good. 5% acidity vinegar for cleaning moldy frames. I mean, you might want to let it spray and leave it for a while. That's what I do, and then I come back and just scrub gently. Yeah, I'll look into you that. That's actually better. Thank you. Natural. Okay. Let's see. I think we've covered everything on mold here. Sun exposure. Um. So sun exposure is incredibly important. Um, the warmer it is, the more likely it is that these can take cleansing flights and can do some light foraging. So consider your winter sun position. How much sun is the hive going to get during the day? Particularly how much sun is the hive entrance going to get during the day? Um, wind exposure is also a factor. You don't wanna have a bunch of cold wind blowing across the, the front of the hive because that's really going to limit how how many bees are going to be able to come in and out of the hive. If you've got some wind problems, uh, you can use all sorts of things to help prevent the wind from going across the entrance. You can use some fencing, you can use some hay bales, um, you can reorient the hive. This does take a couple of days for the bees to figure out what's going on, so it's better to do it before winter sets in if you're going to reorient the entrance of the hive for wind exposure. Uh, bees do need optimal sun exposure during the winter. So they need to have the sun to uh, go on their cleansing flights and do some minor foraging, clean things out. Um, as it's warmer, the mortician bees are going to be moving. You're not gonna have as much mess on the bottom board, that sort of thing. Um, what I like to do, and this isn't for everyone, I've got my bees in my backyard so I can easily manage and do a bunch of cleanup, but I have my colonies underneath the deciduous tree. So in the middle of summer, they've got plenty of uh, plenty of shade in the late afternoon and lots of light in the early morning. In the winter time, they have basically full sun, but it does require quite a bit of cleanup and you don't want any of the dead leaves blocking anything up or causing mold problems or anything like that. So it's definitely an option. Uh, my plum tree does drop branches occasionally, so I have to keep an eye on that as well. <laughs> Let's see. So winter bee behavior and hive configuration. We're gonna start talking about moving boxes around, removing or adding equipment, this sort of thing. 
So the ideal fall hive configuration, this is what you should be seeing in your colonies right now. You should have your winter cluster focused on the bottom brood box. You should have resources throughout. There shouldn't really be any empty space in here, except for maybe a couple of frames right here in the top box. Uh, some beekeepers will actually insert empty frames into the top box in the center, and that will help with thermoregulation deeper in winter because when the bees go up into the empty cells, they will each fill an empty cell and that'll help with uh, insulation. Mm -hmm. Don't want too many empties though, because you do want plenty of resources for them to consume. Um, so during fall inspections, keep an eye on where your bees are and where the resources are. They're not always going to give you the perfect winter configuration in the fall. So you may have to do some rearranging. Many of my colonies are still in the top box. So what I've done is I've swapped them. I have essentially taken the top box with my cluster in it and moved it down. Mm -hmm. So I've got two boxes now completely full of resources and my cluster is where it should be. Just... Yep, flip flop. Okay. So box number one becomes box number two. If a box has no usable resources or is over half empty, I will typically remove it and store it for winter. Mm -hmm. You want to have a nice compressed box. You want to have lots of resources for them, but you don't want to have too much room because then you run the risk of the cluster moving into an empty area and not being able to move into an area with resources. Mm -hmm. It's not so much a temperature thing. Typically the cluster will heat uh, like I said, they have that outer shell of bees and then the inner cluster is nice and warm. They will warm the cluster, not the outside. So you're not really worried about temperature. You're mostly worried about where the bees are going to move during the winter. Ideally, the cluster should start um, in the middle frames. Occasionally, you'll have your bees kind of on a side wall. So this time of year, you can still do some moving around, try and get them center centralized. If you've got brood in there, don't disturb the brood nest at all, but you can move a resource frame out to the side. So brood frames all remain the same, but can shift. And then early winter hive configuration, as you can tell, the cluster has moved from the bottom and is slowly moving upwards. Um, they are consuming the resources as they go. The cluster of bees should remain compact and spherical, especially when it's nice and cold. Um, they will follow their food resources upward and sometimes to the side. Through winter, not too much you can do, so just kind of let them do their thing. This should be what they're looking like. As temperatures expand and contract, you're going to have your cluster expand and contract. They may go out on foraging flights, cleansing flights as it gets warmer, and then grow tighter as, uh, as it gets colder or during the night. If you have a day over 55 degrees, no rain, not too much wind, uh, you should see activity at the entrance. You should see the bees coming and going. If you don't see that, it definitely warrants a closer look. You may need to do some emergency feed. You may have a bed out. Um, it's possible that there's not just, just, just not too much activity. So you can knock on the side of the hive and put your, put your ear up to it and you can hear them inside. So even if it's a little bit too cold, you should be able to hear them. Uh, late winter hive configuration. Late winter, your brood rearing is going to continue and your cluster is going to start moving a lot slower because they're going to have a lot of immobile brood that they're going to have to take care of and have to keep warm. So brood rearing usually begins the winter solstice. That means the ambient heat inside the hive is going to raise significantly. Um, the heat must be at around 93 degrees to keep the brood warm. And the hives are most vulnerable now, not only because they have more mouths to feed, but because they're less mobile, because they have to protect that brood. Um, at this point, bees are typically relying on protein reserves in their bodies, so the vitiligellum uh, that, that, that they were born with. And they're using that to care for the brood. When spring hits, you're going to reverse this configuration. So once temperatures begin to rise, the brood really begins to expand. This box down here is empty now. They have consumed the resources as they moved up, and this box down here is empty. They're not really going to want to move down. So once spring comes, the weather warms up a little bit, you're going to swap these boxes again, 
and you're going to put that cluster back in the bottom box. And that's going to be your, your spring configuration right there. And then again, they're always going to want to move up. Um, having an extra full honey super on top of this two brew box setup is definitely acceptable. I usually leave a full honey super on there in the event that winter is too cold or too long. They still have room to move up and they don't top out. Um, it's okay to have an extra full honey super on top of this configuration, just as extra winter feed. So moving into key points, I'm just going to kind of reiterate what we've been talking about uh, thus far. Uh, winter prep happens all season long. The whole beekeeping season, you're really getting ready for winter. Uh, happy summer bees and fall bees are more likely to survive the winter. You need those summer bees to raise the fall bees, which are going to get the colony through winter. Good nutrition in the active season is paramount. Make sure they're at weight um, whenever you can. Provide extra protein. Provide sugar syrup if they're light. Keep an eye on the weather. Um, that can really tell you a lot about the hardships your colony may or may not have. Mite control is absolutely critical to success over the winter. So start your treatments in spring. It's a lot easier to keep mite treatments down than to try and bring down a high mite count. So don't treat in honey flow, but do treat after honey flow and also treat before winter. So if you can, you're getting your spring treatment, your after honey flow and your pre-winter treatment. So that's three treatments during the active season and a possible oxalic acid during the off season. Ah, this is actually a photo right here of the wind block that I was talking about before. Mm -hmm. Just an extra fencing piece. Rudimentary, but effective. Uh, preparing for winter as far as equipment and modifications to the hive itself. Good ventilation and moisture wicking material should be added. Um, if you've got a standard inner cover, considering using a Vivaldi inner cover or a Jacobson inner cover for extra ventilation above the hive. You can add a compressed moisture board to this or other moisture wicking material. Um, like we said, the non-bleached wool, the burlap, the beach towels, uh, any moisture wicking material. Proper winter configuration should be arranged by the beekeeper, like we were talking about with the, the winter configuration, where the colony should be and where they should be expected to go. Empty boxes need to be removed. Uh, brood box should be in the lowest position. Uh, rain cover is always nice to have, whether it's an outside structure rain cover or if it's just a piece of plywood on top of the cover of the rock on there to hold it from the wind. Uh, this will allow bees to take their cleansing flights even on rainy days. The windbreak to prevent chilling, uh, repair any equipment that has holes in it or um, will create a draft. Tilt the hive slightly forward, allowing droplets to fall forward and exit the hive entrance without actually falling on the cluster. Uh, make sure you have your mouse guard or your entrance reducer installed and properly oriented. And make sure you have winter feed at the ready. So your winter protein, your 4%, and your dry granulated sugar or fondant. And losses will absolutely happen. Um, like I said at the very beginning of the class, uh, this last year was around 22%, I think was the, the figure of uh, losses. So it will happen. It's almost inevitable. You're going to have some losses, but learn from those losses. You're definitely not alone. Um, they can be seen as learning opportunities. And even if preparations are perfect, you can still have winter losses. And moving through the winter, there is really not too much you can do to help out. Uh, avoid opening the hives when it's too cold, too rainy, too windy. Um, emergency feeding is possible, but no liquid syrup at all. Keep an eye on the weather. Warm, dry days, no wind. 55 degrees is the minimum to enter the hive, and visit should be short, between 5 and 10 minutes. Sun exposure and ventilation can really help. Um, keep in mind that laying does begin at the solstice, so much sooner than most people would think. Um, and winter is the perfect time to sit back, 
with a nice blanket and a book, um, paint some new hive equipment, read a book, order new packages or nukes to expand the apiary, replace any dead outs, that sort of thing. But you're basically going to be staying out of the hive once it actually comes to the winter itself. Uh, moving into spring, bit of a transition. You've got to keep an eye on the weather. It happens at a different time every year. Um, so brood rearing is going to begin uh, late January, early February. Your super bees, your winter bees that are surviving all winter, are going to briefly revert to foraging before dying. Uh, your protein supply is critical. At this point, you are having brood in the colony, and you should swap from your winter protein, your 4%, to your active season protein, which is closer to 18%. It's still too early in this early early spring here to feed liquid syrup because day times are typically going to be below 55 degrees still. So continue feeding your dry sugar at this point. Uh, swap boxes if you get a really nice warm day. Make sure that the empty box is on the bottom. If you have uh, your, your cluster split between the boxes, leave it alone. You have to have a completely empty box if you're going to swap your boxes. And then moving into spring, you get ready for your spring buildup and we start the classes all over again. <laughs> so thank you everyone for putting up with my long windedness. It's awesome. But can I do the very, very first um, one with that guy's name? The very uh, first? The camera. First oh, do it here on. Yes. Can I just, yeah. The, yeah, thank you. I didn't get the picture of that one. I know it's on, going to be on the video, but. There we are. There we go. You got it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And does anybody have any additional questions? Is that the Karen of this book here? Yes, this is the Karen that writes this book. And that's where you're going to read your book. I've been telling you that. Yes, I've got, I've got way too many books here. <laughs> that's not the library. Dewey Caron puts on a really good show, too. He shows up uh, in the early spring to talk about his... Um, uh, Pacific Northwest Honeybee Loss Survey at the Lynn Benton Beekeepers Association. Mm -hmm. So you'll get to see him once a year, and he is absolutely hilarious. He's wonderful. Mm -hmm. cool. Thank you. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, everyone.